Hi, welcome back. Our last, our last lesson on color related to uh, the meanings of color and the moods that can be created with color. And this week we're going to focus more on the way that we see um, and the different kind of optical aspects of colors and their relation to each other and to us. The homework assignment, like always, will be about how to influence our viewer into understanding our concept, just like last week, but it's going to use one of the um, aspects of color that we talk about in this, in this lesson. Um, so we'll get back to that at the end of the, at the, end of the lesson. But um, I'm sure you've probably heard of the terms rods and cones before. These are the different kinds of receptors in our eyes that allow us to see in different kinds of light. So in dark light, we see more with our rods, and in bright light, uh, we see more with our cones. And most people um, in the world have three sets of cones, and these would be called trichromatic people. Um, and we would commonly refer to them as people who are not colorblind. Whereas there are some people who have two sets of um, cones instead of three, and so they are unable to see certain colors, and we would commonly refer to those people as colorblind. Um, here we have a chart to identify whether you know you might be colorblind or not. If you can see the numbers here, then you likely have trichromatic vision. Um, if you can't see some of them, you might have um, dichromatic vision, meaning two sets of, of cones. Um, there are animals who have fewer and more sets of cones than the average human being. For instance, um, you might have heard the, that dogs see in grayscale. Well, that's not exactly true. They don't see as if they're looking at an old movie. Um, they do see some grays, but they also are able to see blue and uh, yellow. And then there are also animals be, um, other than humans that can actually see more colors than we can, who have four sets of cones. And so they can see colors like ultraviolet that we're not able to see. Um, in fact, there are there are many more colors in the world that humans can't see, um, which is something kind of interesting to just contemplate and imagine what it could possibly be like. But, we, but the interesting thing is we couldn't possibly know because we will have never experienced anything like that. Um, this Derval Research Institute uh, was conducting research a few years ago to try to determine if some people might have four sets of cones. Um, I don't think that's the case but they came up with this chart that I think is a little bit handy because it can give you a sense of how um, many, how well you are able to distinguish between different colors. And I don't think that there is such a thing as a people with a fourth cone, um, although their research hasn't come out conclusively yet. I don't believe it. But what I do find is that people who are painters or who uh, work with different colored pigments and mix them in order to create the colors that they're looking for are able to identify more types of colors just because they're kind of honed into it. Um, and so uh, if, if you're looking at a larger screen, don't try this on your phone because you won't be able to see as many, um, as many different colors here. But if you're on a computer, I would encourage you to pause me and count as many different colors as you can here. So pause me now. Okay, uh, if you're back, there are 39 different colors here. A lot of them are very similar to each other. If you were able to distinguish between more of them, it probably means that you spent more time thinking about color and mixing color um, in your life, but it could also relate to whether or not you have um, two or three sets of cones. Um, any given color has uh, three different characteristics, value, hue, and saturation. And I wish we could show these in one chart, but because it has three different um, characteristics, it would end up looking like a cube, and it wouldn't be something I could show on here. Um, the value of a color refers to how dark or light it is. So if we're looking at the graph on the left, um, you see that the value is the characteristic um, going up and down. And so the colors that are closer to the bottom are darker and the ones closer to the top are lighter. And value, this aspect of color, and this is very important to remember these three and what they're called and what the difference is. The value relates to how light or dark any given color is. Now the hue is the characteristic that's shown left to right on uh, the chart on the left. And it has to do with what we would traditionally think of as the color um, or you know 
how warm or cool it is, okay? So if we think about blue, we say that it's a very cold color. You think about orange, it's the warmest color, um, and the colors in between are somewhere in between there. So hue relates to how warm or cool a color is. And saturation refers to how intense it is. So looking at the color chart on the right, the first row has colors that are very saturated, you know, very intense, um, and then the opposite of that is desaturated, but a color could be desaturated and light, or it could be desaturated and dark. Um, and so if we're looking at these, the far left row has the original color that's being shown. The next one, uh, the middle row, I'm sorry, the middle column shows the um, same colors in a lighter value and desaturated, and the one to the far, the column to the far right shows these colors in a darker value and desaturated. You could also take them and not change their value and just kind of desaturate them, which means you wouldn't be making them necessarily darker or lighter, but you would be making them a little bit duller looking. So we might think of a color like red, but every red is different. Just like in the other lesson we talked about, every pink is different, every possible color um, has its own three sets of these characteristics. And so here we have a color that we would think of as red. The one on the left has a warmer hue because it's closer to orange. The one on the right has a cooler hue because it's closer to purple. Uh, the one on the left is more saturated because it's more kind of intense looking, and the one on the right is a little bit, it's still very saturated, but it's not as saturated as the one on the left. It's a little bit more desaturated if we we're going to compare the two. And lastly, the one on the right is, uh, I would say the one on the right is slightly darker, even though they're pretty similar in terms of their uh, lightness and darkness across. But um, particularly in the, um, at the edges, the one on the left seems to, you know, where the petals stick up a little bit, the one on the left seems to be a lighter color. So there are lots of different color systems. It's very complicated, but this is the one that you probably traditionally would come across. It's the pigment colors. So uh, there's a different system for computers, there's a different system for printers, but in terms of pigments, I'm referring to things like paint or colored pencils, anything that you combine by hand on paper or any other surface, anything that's uh, tactile, okay? So um, our primary colors in this color system, the pigment system, are blue, red, and yellow. If we combine the colors with those next to it, on the uh, primary color wheel, we get our secondary colors, which are orange, green, and purple. So if you mix yellow and blue, you get green, okay? I think that's pretty clear. The third level of mixing are called tertiary colors. And so if you mix purple and um, blue, you get like a purpley blue. You know, it's these ones where you use both um, of the, 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 uh, t the primary and secondary color terms and, and add a Y to them, you know, like a yellowy orange or something like that. All right, still talking about pigments here, and we're still talking about hue. We remember that even within the primary colors, there are multiple versions of them. There's a lighter and a darker, sorry, there's a, um, a warmer and a cooler version of each, and lots of other versions in between those. So for example, looking at the red, you remember the red roses. We have the one that's closer to orange, which is a, uh, a warmer red, and the one that's closer to purple, which is a um, cooler red. If you look at yellows, we've got a warmer and a cooler yellow. The one is closer to orange, the other is closer to green. But if you look at the blue, whether you step towards um, green or whether you step towards purple, it's gonna get warmer than what it would be if with just like a purest kind of in-between blue because blue is the coldest possible color, okay? So you see how the one that's a little bit closer to green um, is getting a little bit warmer because that's closer to yellow. And the one that's closer to purple is getting a little, little bit warmer because that's the one next to uh, red. So 
So blue is a, um, the absolute coldest. And if we were to look straight across the color wheel from it, we see a secondary color, which is orange. And it is the absolute warmest uh, color. And so if we were to, um, you don't see multiple um, colors for the secondary colors on this chart, unfortunately. But let's say we had multiple oranges. Uh, one was a little bit closer to yellow and the other one was a little bit closer to red. Both of those are getting a little bit cooler, a step away from um, the warmest possible one, but they're still moving in different directions where they look different than each other, okay? So, why am I telling you all this? <laughs> because often people will have their pigments, either um, paints or colored pencils or whatever you're using, and they want to make, let's say, a purple. And so they mix the, um, the blue and the red together. And if you were to do this with the, um, the purple that is closer, I'm sorry, the red that is closer to purple and the blue that is closer to purple, then you're gonna get purple. But So if you look at this chart here, I'm gonna try to um, draw on it. If we were to mix this one with this one, we'll get a beautiful purple. Now, if we were to mix this one, the, the one that's closer to green with either one of them, but let's say even more dramatically with the red that's closer to orange, then you're not gonna get the kind of, um, you know, Crayola color of purple that you might expect. So this is something to take into consideration when you're using pigment colors. Color is very complicated. Now let's talk about the four qualities of any pigment. And the first three are the exact same qualities of any color hue, how warm or cold it is, like we were just discussing, value, how dark or light it is, or anywhere in between, and saturation, how intense or dull it is. But um, with pigments, we also have to think about the translucency and the opacity of that. And so if you were to, um, let's take paint, for example, certain paints will completely cover up what's underneath of them, and certain paints will be see-throughs, where you can see through and then the color underneath and the color on top combine to create the ultimate color that we see. And so if you're working with your colored pencils that are in the kit, for example, you will find that um, painting, I'm sorry, <laughs> drawing with almost any of them over white paper is gonna create a different ultimate color that will be seen than if you were to um, draw with them over black paper. Then ultimately, because they're a little bit translucent, it would probably be a darker color. Now, when you're working with pigments, there are multiple ways to make a color um, darker or lighter. A lighter color we refer to as a tint, and a darker color, and remember how light or dark is referred to as value. A darker um, color with a dark, you know, color with a darker value, uh, we refer to as a shade. Um, and so we take what, think about how you make a color lighter with pigments, for example, but most people would say you add white to it. So let's say I had red and I wanted to make it lighter, I would add white to it and it would become pink, which is certainly a lighter version of uh, what we start off as red. Um, but let's say you don't want it to become pastel. Let's say instead you want it to be um, still very saturated because adding white to it will make it desaturated. Um, there is another way to go about it. You could take a white base, like a um, white canvas, a white piece of paper, and then very lightly go over it with translucent pigment of red, so that way it becomes lighter, but it also is still saturated because you haven't mixed that white in that's opaque. It makes the whole thing look like creamy or like a pastel. Now there's different ways to create shades. Um, one of them is to add uh, black. Um, that will make more of a, a very desaturated sort of color. Another one is to um, use the complement. You might have heard this before, I don't know. But to add the complement to a color would be to add a tiny bit of the um, pigment of the color that's across from the color wheel. So let's say I wanted to make a red that was a little bit darker. I might add a little bit of green to it and it would create a type of a shade. Now that would look different than if I added black to it. 
And um, another option would be to just add a slightly different color that's closer to it on the color wheel. So if I wanted a darker red, I could add maybe a little bit of purple because that's inherently a darker color. But then, of course, that would affect it as well because it would make it a cooler hue. So there's just so many things to think about. Now let's go back to this idea about um, mixing a bit of the complementary color into your pigment to make it darker. Sometimes this will work. But imagine you're trying to make a darker purple. The complement would be yellow, but if you were to add a little bit of yellow to it, it's not going to make your purple darker. In fact, it will probably make it lighter because purple is inherently darker color and yellow is an inherently, sorry, purple is an inherently darker pigment and yellow is an inherently lighter pigment. So it's very complicated. <laughs> For the last few minutes, we've been discussing pigment-based color wheels, but there are different color wheels that are used on computers and by printers. Okay, so if you look at the one on the left, it's the RGB uh, color wheel, red, green, and blue. And this is the color system used by uh, computers and electrical devices like televisions, um, cell phones, anything that shines um, white light from behind it the surface of the uh, device, okay? I don't know why it works. I have absolutely no idea why it works, but it does. <laughs> um, now, if you are taking a photograph for the class and you want to, or for any reason, and you want to print it off, um, your digital image or the thing that you make in Photoshop or whatever, your digital illustration, will probably be automatically in RGB because that's the system for electronics. Now, in order to get the colors to be more true to what you see on the screen when you print them, it's important to switch that to CMYK. If you don't, it'll still be you know, the same photograph. It'll still look pretty good. But if you really care about keeping the colors the same as you see them on the computer in your RGB system, switch it to CMYK. This stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, or the K stands for key. I think they refer to it as key rather than black because if it was B, it would be confused with blue from, from the RGB. So anyway, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key. The reason you have to switch them is because printing onto a surface no longer allows you to have that glow from behind. You know, the, the, the page on which you're printing or whatever surface upon which you're printing does not have a glow from behind of white light. And so it's not emanating anything. And so this is the system that printers use. Again, I don't know why it works. It's completely different. Both of these are completely different than pigment um, color wheels. Uh, I don't know why, but this is how it is. <laughs> now let's talk about some of the optical, sort of optical illusions that relate to color. Um, and one of them is the bezel effect. And this just refers to the fact that a color looks different based on the uh, other colors around it or the environment in which it is um, presented to us. And so if we stare at these, this uh, image above us, it looks like the red on the right that is against the black background is more saturated and the one on the left is less saturated. It also looks like the one on the right is maybe a little bit closer to orange, I think, than the one on the left. And you might see it a little bit differently. Um, but the important thing is the reds don't look the same to you, right? And that's because the way that we see them is affected by the things around them. Now, this is something that you deal with every day in your life um, when you're getting dressed <laughs> or when you're uh, out shopping for clothing for yourself because certain colors look bad on us and certain colors look good on us. So for example, me, I'm right now wearing a, a, a pastel blue shirt. It looks pretty good on me. You know, I don't look sick, but if I were to take it off, if I were to switch into a, um, a lime, neon lime green shirt, suddenly my skin, even though it's exactly the same color um, as in this shirt, would look kind of sickly, unwell, um, and so as you, you know, decide what to wear, you are also considering this idea of the bezel effect. Um, and of course, some people look great in lime green. I'm just, I'm just not one of them. Now, 
Another optical illusion that we get from uh, colors in um, coordination with other colors is that when you have saturated, uh, a saturated color against its complementary color, remember the one that's across the color wheel um, within the pigment system, and they're both saturated and they're next to each other, we get a sort of a visual vibration. You know, it's almost kind of hard to look at, particularly the one on the left where it's more extreme and um, like kind of larger shapes that interact more. Um, the one on the right, doesn't it sort of look like the red ones pop out a little bit? Sometimes it can be hard to look at things that are really saturated and um, opposites on the color wheel. So it's kind of fun for artists to use sometimes if you want to make your work um, either uh, something is, which is hard to make out what the image is at first, like in this example by Chris O'Feely, where um, at first, because of the vibrations that you're getting, it's hard to focus on the image. Um, or sometimes people can um, use this in order to play with um, just the optics themselves. So you've heard of op art as opposed to pop art, optical illusion art. Um, and looking here, uh, when we first look at this Chris O'Feely painting, it, it, it vibrates a lot. We have to kind of adjust our eyes for a moment before we can really start to um, decipher what's happening here. And then we notice that it's a couple and they're staring into each other's eyes and the woman is pregnant and the man has his uh, hands on her stomach. But because of that vibration, it's, it's not as uh, quick as if this was made with full range of colors. Optical mixing refers to when we don't actually take two colors pigment colors and blend them together with, you know, like mix them together with a paintbrush, but rather just have them next to each other um, all over the place. <laughs> and so here, uh, and that creates in our minds the secondary color or the, the color that's between the two that you're combining here. And so here we have red and yellow. We don't actually have any orange, but in some places where the red and yellow are fairly equivalent, you know, if the red's not that much bigger, I mean, not taking up that much more space, and the yellow is not taking up that much more space, it starts to look like orange to us because our mind finishes that for us. That uh, is something that is used in printing comics. I think um, some newspaper comics are printed in different ways now, but at the time, uh, but early comics were printed, so with the, um, the dots creating um, the colors by mixing them together. So here particularly, you can see the woman is has a, a yellow background to her skin uh, on the far left image and then red dots above it and it makes her look sort of orange. And if we look over at the man, uh, it looks like he's in shadow. We've got red and blue creating a kind of a purple shadow stripe across him. And then we have a number of different colors um, to the far left blue, um, red, and a yellow kind of base um, that creates a kind of a darker yellow as if his skin is still a little bit in shadow, but not quite as much as the stripes. Um, other artists who have used this are um, below, you can see a Van Gogh self-portrait. Um, and he was an impressionist. He put down colors with paint um, next to one another rather than blending them together. And above, we see a whole different system for that by the artist, um, American artist Chuck Close. In this, he he um, divided the fig, the the woman who's being uh, the portrait into a bunch of rectilinear shapes, and then within them added the biomorphic um, color lines that go around and, and connect up with themselves um, with other colors inside and other colors inside of those, but. So if you were to look at this up close, it would just almost look like a um, stained glass. But when you stand back, you can see um, that all these colors combined create the image of the woman. Remember the good old bezel effect that we talked about a few minutes ago? And just as a recap, it's when um, a color looks different depending on the colors near it. This came up as a kind of a viral argument years ago on the internet. You might I've heard about this. So years ago, people posted the photograph on the upper left to the internet and people 
started commenting on it saying, what a beautiful um, blue and black dress that is. And other people said, aren't you, you're crazy. That is a gold and white dress. Um, and this erupted on the internet because people couldn't understand how anybody else would see it differently than they did. Then another photograph went around the internet of the actual dress in a um, shop window. You can see that the woman, at that point, the, um, the craze had already kind of taken over and hashtagged the dress, and that woman is adding a, a tag to it to identify that this was the dress that was in the photograph. Now, it is in a completely different light, isn't it? So there we can see that it truly is blue and black. But the question really wasn't about what the color of the dress was. The question was about what color the photograph of the dress shows, right? And so we can all agree that the colors that we see in the photograph on the left are different than the colors that we see in the dress on the right, even though it's the same. But that photograph was taken backlit, so there were shadows on her, and maybe the lighting in that room was like yellowy or whatever. It's different. It was different. It wasn't bright, you know, store lighting. And all of those things affected um, the, the photograph. And so the question wasn't what color was the dress before it was in this situation with this lighting. The question was what color is the photograph showing um, in the parts of the photograph that are the dress. <laughs> complicated. So someone um, identified a little swatch you can see below. Um, uh, they have a rectangle over the darker section and a rectangle over the lighter section of the dress. And then um, the very bottom left, they, I, they um, isolated those swatches. And then in the next column, you see the generalized color from that swatch. And you see that, in fact, it's more of a kind of a mustardy brown or um, like what we might um, think of as like part of um, a gradient that would create gold, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then the other color, the lighter color, is sort of a desaturated robin's egg blue sort of color. And this is a great example of, of how people see, everybody sees a color completely differently than everybody else. Um, and this is partly because of us being either trichromatic or dichromatic or um, uh, or because um, of other things affecting the thing that we're looking at, like the bezel effect. So you can see that she's got a bright white light next to her. Um, and so ultimately, a color that is what it is. Like, for example, I said my shirt is light blue. Um, but if I was against a really bright blue wall, then my shirt might look white because it would be so much less of an intense kind of darker blue than that one. That would affect the way that it was seen. And so all these things like vibrations and the bezel effect and the fact that we all have um, different rods and cones completely changes the way that we all interpret a color. And so that's optical color. The local color is what the actual pigment is, okay? Now we'll talk about value shifts. And you'll remember that the term value relates to how dark or light a color is. So in a um, depiction of metal, we would say that this is, for example, is gold. But gold is not one color. Any metallic is not one color. It's a, uh, a bunch of shifts of color that gradually change. And so looking at this on the far left, we have the desaturated yellow, <laughs> the kind of tannish yellow. And then it becomes a little, a little bit darker and a little bit cooler. And then it becomes a little bit darker but warmer. And then it's almost a reddish kind of light brown. And then it shifts back to being kind of tan. And then it shifts to being kind of more warm again. And so when we see um, metallics, we're actually seeing a multiple colors um, that shift in their values in a, um, across the picture plane or you know, whatever the shape is that the, that's supposed to be metallic in the image. Um, and so gold is not one color. It's a bunch of colors that shift gradually across each other. Same with silver, same with any kind of metallic. Now, there are metallic paints, of course, and you could paint something metallic, but that, if you took something that's painted with metallic paint and put it in front of a light, it would shine back at you, right? It, it wouldn't um, 
necessarily look like it is metallic. If you took a photograph of it, it would just look like one color um, because it's being hit by light right from the front. For something to really look metallic, you have to have those shifts. Now, here's another, um, here's a way to think about um, color shifts within an artwork or within a design. This is a painting of um, Judas slaying Hellophrenes. It's a story from the Old Testament. And but what I want you to focus on here is the fact that um, there are really dark darks and there are really light lights that are very close together. And so if you're looking at Hellophrenes, this is the guy having his head cut off. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, his arm is really light because it's highlighted against the really dark background. And if you look at um, his lower arm, the one that's below his head, he's got really bright bicep, but the back of his arm is so dark in shadow that it can start to blend in with the black of the background. This sort of very dramatic lighting situation um, is called chiaroscuro. And um, that came from the Italian words for uh, kind of light and shadow, or light and dark. Um, and this was a very popular form of um, lighting situation for paintings during the Baroque period in Europe. Another way of um, shifting values is sfumato, which is another Italian word um, that means smoke. Okay, and in a sfumato color a value scheme, the, the highlighted parts and the parts that are dark have more of a smooth transition between them. It's not an abrupt like black and white, you know, or really, really dark blue against, you know, super light yellow or whatever, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be black and white. But um, here we have softer uh, transitions and it gives you more of a, um, a calm feeling the background isn't starkly dark. It uh, has lots of different values and highlights within it. But I want you to particularly pay attention to her skin. Look at the underside of her neck. It's dark, and then it goes to the high, most highlighted part, like right um, at her bosom. But there isn't a very stark line where the dark stops and then the light starts. It's a really smooth transition between the two. Okay, now, the important thing um, is that these are two different ways of setting up uh, lights, even though light is coming from the side of each one. So in each one, things look really round. But um, when the um, shifts are smooth like this, it gives the viewer kind of a calm feeling. It makes you think of like kind of a lovely topic. Whereas when you have really bright, extreme, sorry, not bright, but very extreme contrast between your lights and darks, like in Kiro you get more of a dramatic feel, so it makes sense to use that for a dramatic type of subject matter. Now, uh, here is an artist, Kehinde Wiley, he's a contemporary artist, and he, you can see not all artworks are either one or the other, lots of um, artworks have something in between. And so in both of these, he has really um, particular lighting, you know, lighting is coming from one side, or the other, or as the example on the right, you've got two different lights, one that's kind of warm and orange coming from the right, and one that's kind of uh, cooler and more of a kind of a white light coming from the front, okay? So you don't have to do one or these two extremes. <laughs> and you also need to think about what colors the lights are that you're choosing to um, light on your, your scene. So like, for example, I said that the one on the right has very orange light coming from the right. So that's something else to take into consideration. But um, there are reasons for going to the extremes of either making something very contrasting in its value shifts or very um, kind of softer in its value shifts. Um, and that is to really push a mood. And so this is a scene from Hamlet. I think part of the reason we identify with this chiaroscuro syllogic still today um, is because we often see it in stage lighting. So in a dramatic play like Hamlet, um, where there's all kinds of murder happening, <laughs> you often see a super dark background and a really bright spotlight to kind of add to the tension in the drama, okay? Let's look at another Shakespeare play. 
This one, oh, I'm sorry for the pixelation. Uh, this one is Much Ado About Nothing, which is a, it's a romance, it's a farce, so it's a comedy. And here we see um, the characters, uh, I'm not exactly sure what scene this is, but you'll note that the stage design here is very different than in the Hamlet. Um, even though it's nighttime, the highlights and the shadows on them are a lot less dramatically um, contrasting. You've got a background that you can really see, and all the lights are softer. They're sort of diffused coming from more directions, right? So we get more of a kind of a relief, a relieved feeling from this than we did from the handle. And this one, um, I don't know what play this is. I found this image on an article talking about which are the best drama schools in the country. And I actually did not identify what the image came from. And so um, we can only speculate. But, and so take a minute, um, look at this, pause it, and think about what kind of play you think this might be. Okay, um, you're back. So there's no right answer exactly, but there's lots of things that we take into consideration, right? One of them is um, the body language uh, of the two people um, and their expressions, of course, but then another would be the lighting. And so I might guess with this is that it's probably a drama and not a comedy because um, there is a lot of contrast between the figures in the foreground and the um, darkness in the background. So that would clue us into the, that it might be a dramatic kind of situation. Also, or you know, a more dramatic story overall. Because um, they're inside a room too. It could be, they could have more lights in a room, even if it was nighttime. But that's a signifier to us that it might be a drama. Um, and then of course, then also they, they don't look particularly happy and they're not looking at each other. So it kind of gives us that sense too. So the subject and the lighting all kind of support each other in this idea that it's, you know, it might be a drama. All right, let's talk about, uh, let's just have a look at these. This is everything we covered today. Just pause me for a second, look through all of these. If there's any that you're unsure about, maybe go back and watch that part again. Um, and if you're still unsure after watching it, you know, certainly ask me, um, put it on Celtic Online or ask me in class. Now, for your homework, <clears throat> you will be creating two different photographs, setting up two different scenes. One of them will have very dramatic lighting with a lot of contrast, and it should be a dramatic subject matter. And the other one will be a softer kind of lighting situation, you know, something more like the scrumato. And you don't have to think of these as chiaroscuro and scrumato, um, you know, because those terms tend to make us think about like Baroque and Renaissance European paintings. And this is a photograph, this is nothing to do, well, I mean, not, not nothing to do, but it's, you're not making a Renaissance painting. What you're doing is you're creating a dramatically lit, um, with a lot of contrast and a very dark background type of image, like you might see in a dramatic stage lighting, and you're making another photograph where, you know, the lighting situation is still uh, clearly distinct. You know, it's going to be coming from one side, but the highlights will transition in a smoother way into the shadows. And so for something like that, that has more of a calm, lovely feel to it in terms of the lighting, you're going to want to think of a kind of calm and lovely scene, okay? And your two images do not necessarily have to talk to each other. They don't have to, they could if you want them to, but they don't have to be related to each other because they're both going to have very different subject matters that are supported by the type of lighting that you use. Now I'm going to uh, start the demo for this um, next in this video, but this demo, this demo was originally made for a, a painting class. And so in that assignment, they were um, taking the photographs like you're doing today, but then they were also creating paintings out of them. You don't have to do that. So I think I did mention a painting technique or two in the video. I say a la prima and I say um, glazing method. Just ignore that part. You're just taking photographs. <laughs> um, and this, this um, demo is about how to technically create the lighting situation. So it's not like I'm actually designing an entire um, artwork here. I'm just doing the technical stuff. And so what I have shot here isn't necessarily um, like a, um, a piece that I would turn in, okay? It was just showing you how to do the lighting for that. And so really brainstorm, think, uh, you know, do a lot of prep work in your 
sketchbook coming up with ideas and thinking what do you actually have access to, what objects and like what kind of environments do you have access to that you could go to and get this lighting all set up. In the lecture part of this video, we talked about the difference between chiaroscuro and sfumato lighting and what the, they're used for. So you'll remember that chiaroscuro lighting is used for dramatic situations, okay? Because it looks a lot like stage lighting. And so here uh, you have everything you need. You need a little light, a dark background, and um, whatever it is that you're going to be um, taking the photograph of for your, for your painting. And so I'm gonna pick a dramatic scene for this, um, like a scene from Hamlet. And so I have model here and a skull for that. But um, you remember that with chiaroscuro lighting, we have really stark contrast between the foreground and the background. So you can see that I've put a dark fabric up in the background. And if you're at home and you don't have a dark fabric, you can just buy some black trash bags, cut them apart and tape those to your wall. That works just as well. Um, and just wait for nighttime to get your room dark if it's impossible to black out your, your lights, all right? So you can see that the lighting in this scene is not perfect because the um, fabric behind him is lit, which makes it look lighter than it is. So what I'll do is I will rearrange the light so that it's no longer facing the background at all, but it's still lighting my scene, and that didn't work. So <laughs> I'll just keep rearranging it until the fabric behind the scene is not lit but the people still are lit. Okay, so that's a lot better. You can see that it's quite a lot darker um, in the fabric, but we could probably make it even a little better if we were to pull this out. All right, so now he's not lit enough. So let's move the table a little bit forward. So, Sean, could you get up? Yeah. So, thanks. So we already had a distance behind the table before, but now we're increasing that distance to allow for a brightly lit foreground and a darkly lit background. So let's move this back even a little bit more. And I'll keep tinkering with that until I have it perfect. And when I come back, I'll have the phone on the tripod so we can pretend like it's the camera that you would be using to shoot. So now you can see the lighting is really pretty good. The background is quite dark and the foreground is really lit. Um, and we've chosen this scene because it's uh, dramatic. So let's have the model pick up the skull. And if you have someone who is modeling for you, you can direct them a little bit. So I already suggested to Sean that the skull should be turned at an angle so that way one side of it would be quite lit and the other side darker and that we'd also be able to still see his face. Um, so turn uh, kind of towards the back a little bit more, Sean, with your face. So originally he was, he was sort of sat up like this and you could see that that's not ideal because the skull's um, shadow is cast on his nose and so you can't see him really starkly. Um, so move your head back the way it was. So something like this would be absolutely perfect. And um, so you could shoot this right here and then go into your phone and crop. I recommended that you buy a tripod for this. And so if you do that, I would prefer if you use a timer so that way you don't touch your phone to take the photograph because if you do touch the phone, it will go like that. You can see how my phone just shook. Um, so here we have the perfect setup for chiaroscuro. Now, if um, we talked about how this is perfect for dramatic scenes, but if you were to put something kind of goofy with this sort of lighting, it makes it all the more funny because of the strange juxtaposition of the lighting and the content. So this is often used for something that would be um, that would be sort of melodramatic or kind of silly in that regard. So let me give him something else to hold, um, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So, Sean, pretend like this guy's like attacking you and you're scared. Okay. Right? <laughs> so he's like, ah! Okay. <laughs> so look terrified. So you can see with <laughs> this kind of lighting, uh, chiaroscuro lighting, if you um, use a funny scene, it almost makes it more ridiculous because of the lighting that we read as being something serious. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now let's set up a different lighting situation for um, Spumato. So this project, you're going to be working with a glazing method, but the next project will be 
glazing um, plus a la prima combined, and that's perfect for something with soft lighting. Um, so let's have him um, face us. And we don't want the lighting to be so stark, so we're going to pull it over here. Now you can see there's really soft transitions between the lights and the darks in his face, but actually we can make it even, the cord isn't, the cord of my light isn't uh, long enough. There we go. So now we've got a pretty soft shadows on his face, but also it's still kind of stark lighting. So what I'm gonna do is take a piece of fabric and cover the light with it. There we go. And so you can see now it's really quite soft. And so this is something like the Mona Lisa was painted with a Sumato lighting situation. And with this, you can have uh, things in the background. It doesn't have to be a stark, uh, dark black in the background like it did with, with chiaroscuro. And so this is used for something that you don't want to be dramatic and you don't want it to be melodramatic. You just want it to be something more lovely. Okay, if you have any questions, post them on Celtic Online. Thank you, Sean.